Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, good to have you all here. Um, so I'm kind of good by speaking like um, off the off the bat, but I wrote some things just to kind of uh, help me like stay on track with like time and uh, making sure everyone can talk and then like ask questions and all that good stuff. So I just want to say hello. I'm glad to be here with you all. Uh, I firstly uh, want to say thank you for being here with us today. Um, I've really been looking forward to being on this panel with these great other like advocates. Um, some of them I know, some of them I don't, so I'm excited for the new people uh, to meet tonight. Um, but yeah, just to be up here like discussing about student activism, um, again, like with some of my favorite people. What's your name? Uh, so my name is Naya McAdoo. Uh, I'm a senior here at KU. Uh, I serve as the current um, student body president at KU. And then um, I also served as president of the KU Black Student Coalition, um, which did a lot of um, activism and like liberation work for um, specifically like black students on campus, um, but just advocating for uh, students of color across campus at large. Um, thank you <laughs> for, yeah, thank you. Cause I definitely just went right into it um, without y'all knowing who you're all talking to. Um, but I do want to do a special thanks to the Emily Taylor Center, uh, the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, the Hall Center uh, for the Humanities and the Watkins Museum um, for partnering, for partnering um, not only to put on this important event, um, but all the events that they were able to host this year and for inviting me to come and moderate this panel um, and contribute my own like student experiences here. So we have some amazing panelists. Um, so I would first uh, like to let them like introduce themselves and also the groups that they represent in our community. Hello, I'm Twisna Rose Mills. I'm the film and film and studies um, graduate student. I represent um, the First Nations Student Association. I'm co-chair of the the Indigenous Studies uh, organization here that's been going on for quite some time. So yeah. Um, other than that, oh, um, yeah, no, um, yeah, so just thankful to be here and representing, you know, the indigenous people here. And uh, again, um, yeah, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Katie Henders. I am also coincidentally from the Film Media Studies Department. Um, I'm uh, currently the grievance chair for uh, GTAC uh, Graduate Teaching Assistance Coalition. I we rarely list out the whole acronym. Um, we are the labor union for the uh, GTAs here on campus. Um, and I've been involved in the union for uh, almost three years now. And that is why I'm here. So cool. Hi, I am Diana. And I am a graduate student of the social welfare program. Um, I am here because I'm the vice president of Surge, and Surge is a reproductive, we fight for reproductive justice, gender equality, and also positive sex education. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jam Hoffman. I am filling in for Cyan Grover, and we represent Lawrence Freeging, Kansas, uh, also known as LFK Eats. Um, which is a mutual aid group that focuses on food insecurity and food apartheid uh, in Lawrence. How do I do this? Should we should I sit back? <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> okay, awesome. So before we get uh, like into talking all together, um, I just wanted to take a little time um, to like introduce. Uh, why we're all here and kind of what we're commemorating with this um, wonderful event um, and really all the events that have been going on uh, this month. So um, I just want to talk about like introducing um, like the women that we're celebrating and then also how like it's impacted our campus and community like when it comes to protesting on campus um, and then the women in history at KU, um, you know, they weren't afraid to stand up for themselves. Um, and also for just women and femmes of the future. So, um, so on February 4th, 1972, a collective of 30 women and four children at KU known as the February Sisters occupied the East Asian Studies Building for 13 hours demanding that the university take the needs of women on campus seriously and grant them an audience to discuss those needs. Um, everyone I think now should have a uh, list of demands um, that these women put together. Um, and so you can all, just like while we're all talking, um, take a look at those. Um, and so, uh, 
the February sisters had six clear demands um, that you will find on that list um, that they were proposing to create a more equitable KU for women. Among those demands included a free daycare on campus, a woman in the financial aid administration, a recruiter that focused that focused on creating higher enrollment rates for high school girls, and equalizing uh, the wages between uh, male and female salaries, just to name a few. So, uh, yeah, we can. Um, me and um, Megan worked to come up like just some questions to propose to the panelists that we can all discuss. Um, and then obviously if there's any like questions that you all have, like please feel free and uh, we can do that as well. Or you can wait and we'll do it at the Q and A uh, towards the end too. So um, I can start with the first one. So uh, how did you become involved with your organization and your activism uh, more broadly? And then we can go down the line. So. Does anybody want to go first? Okay, awesome. Um, hi, so I got involved uh, with the labor union in my master's program in Illinois, um, and it was, I was pretty iffy on joining, but then they showed me a like graphic or like some numbers on how much they'd saved me in fees, and I just had to pay my first fee payment, and it is way more than it is here. So I was um, convinced immediately and joined up and then saw how uh, that, that never mind. That's a different school, different problems. But um, as soon as I got here, I sought out the union and joined, and then uh, joined the leadership team my second year. And now I'm uh, the grievance chair, and I'm also on the negotiations team because um, I think coming together in all of these different ways, we can work towards better things. But I, um, I choose labor because I think that's one way to be super productive and represent the, the interests of women on our campus. Um, so I just started looking for organizations that also represented like what I was interested in. Um, during my undergrad year, I took a women's studies and a sexuality health class. And I really got into reproductive justice. Also, I really got into just women's right in general. Um, from that, when I joined the graduate program here at KU, I was new to Lawrence, I was new to Kansas, and I just really wanted to meet people that had the same interests as me. And so Surge popped up and I decided to join and I've met some pretty great people there. Sure, thanks. Um, I got involved with LFK Eats uh, so the founders were Jimena Ibarra and Cyan Grover, who, like I said, I'm filling in for. Um, they established it, and we knew each other because Jimena had started a local chapter called Jayhawks for Bernie during uh, the 2020 primaries. Um, so we knew each other from that. They started LFK Eats um, together, which was inspired by the Wichita uh, Project, ICT Eats, which is the same deal. And... I wanted to be part of it because I had a lot of faith in them as like student and community leaders and they did a really good job. Um, in terms of like organizing more broadly, I think I started paying a lot more attention to like the importance of organizing communities directly uh, after the murder of George Floyd. I think that was really when it like kind of became clear to me that directly mobilizing people was more important than trying to like work within institutions um, already existing like liberal institutions. Um, so that kind of opened the floodgate of like much more radical literature and, and methods of organizing. And that's, uh, kind of where it started for me. Excuse me. Hello. Uh, well, um, what was the question? How, oh, yep. Um, well, I became part of FENSA, uh, prior to my first degree in indigenous studies back in 2016. But I would say it started before, probably when I was at Haskell, um, we'd come and uh, volunteer and help with the uh, the powwow, the KU powwow that they have every spring. It, it just happened um, this past weekend. And at the time it was in Robertson Hall, or the Robertson gym. So we'd go over there and volunteer. But um, more broadly with activism, um, I, um, with my family, I would say, um, cause I was from Washington state and we, um, I was born into, you know, at the time, I was in the 80s, it was 83 when I was born. So really, it was just more about honoring the treaty rights. My parents would, um, we'd go and uh, go to rallies and protest in honor of Leonard Peltier, 
and just to make awareness, and most of it was about awareness and understanding of uh, sovereignty rights and the rights as Indian people to live that way. So um, yeah, so I became, and again, uh, co-chairs, we had to, during the pandemic, the, a lot of the or student organizations became, um, you know, they kind of fell off. And so I kind of had to step in as uh, leaders do, you kind of step in when you, you, you need you. So that's uh, why I'm co-chair as a graduate student. Um, but yeah, no, um, other than that, I would say um, as leaders here, I think it's just our responsibility, not just as students, but as Katie said, part of you know our labor. But as again, I'm part of the union with her, so I see her a lot. And so yeah, it's really great to uh, you know be, again be a part of this. And again, as activism, I think this is a form of you know positivity and activism in itself, just showing us and honoring these women. You know, 1972, there was a lot going on, and. Uh, the BIA takeover during that time, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on, not just here on campus, but all over the country. And I think that um, just recognizing that is a really great honor, so. Thanks, y'all. Um, and then I'll just speak a little bit for myself. Um, so obviously before becoming student body president, like I said, um, I established the KU Black Student Coalition and served um, as president. Uh, for one year during that. Um, so our group actually got together um, or like I guess officially established and like a protest that happened on campus where we um, like blocked the buses um, for a couple hours, basically protesting um, just for, you know, black students to be seen and heard on campus, um, especially because um, you know, at KU, there had been like a letter talking about like George Floyd, but then it like didn't really address like the disparities on our own campus, like when it comes to like um, violence against like black students, faculty, staff, uh, things like that. And so um, I had met other students at that protest and basically we were just like, we need to do this again. So um, we established the KU Black Student Coalition, which pretty much solely focused us on like protests um, on campus and then um, specific like programming that directly serviced um, black students. Um, so we did, we did um, you know, a sit-in last year um, and that was, you know, an all night sit-in in Strong Hall. Um, and we had some great supporters uh, come out for that. Like we've done uh, chalking like in support of, um, you know, like Black Lives Matter and like missing and murdered like indigenous women, girls uh, and two spirit folks. And then um, also too, we did care packages for black students around um, like winter break and, and just kind of showing up like in the community and showing like, you know, as students, like we can also care for one another, especially like when, um, you know, the people in our institutions like aren't doing it for us. And then um, I would say like as far as Student Senate goes, like this is my first year really being in Student Senate. So also like being student body president was I think kind of like a shock really to myself and maybe like others as well. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm only the second black woman to serve in this position. Um, and I'm also the only second woman of color like in a whole to serve in this position. Um, but there have been women of color like in the student senate space like since the 70s. And so, you know, we do come from a long line of legacy. And so, um, you know, ultimately like there were just things going on in Senate and I, and I know how much like student senate can help students like on a wide scale, but especially like these marginalized communities that aren't receiving um, the help that that they need um, and you know especially when it comes to like women and fems on campus too um, and so you know I decided to run uh, I definitely was the underdog <laughs> ticket you know but we pulled out and then actually my current VP uh, Alessia is the first um, like openly trans woman um, to be like in a leadership role um, and serve as student body vice president so yeah, <laughs> just a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, so I guess another question we can talk about um, is, are there times in the past when your organization struggled to achieve your goals? And then how did you grow or learn from those experiences? Um, well, our goal always is to create awareness um, on campus and with, within the community for not just um, as Haskell, but you know at KU. And so that's why we always want the uh, KU powwow to be on campus. We can we we can always have the alternative to take it to high school, but that defeats the purpose of having a, a University of Kansas powwow. So um, our we never really had our, we're always struggling to pull resources to get um, funds, but we always get donations and we always um, uh, University of Kansas, the Senate always helps and we always get the diversity and equity funds. So again, we always 
we always don't really have backups, but we always count on those people and the resources that we have um, continually each year. And um, if anything, we would, um, and again, you always have to be on your toes and be ready to, as a film and media student, you have to be ready to, you know, change up what, what the plan was. Because again, everything doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. So you gotta be able to adapt to those things. And again, if we had to make, um, you know, I guess a taco sale or anything that would um, bring in the money to um, eventually to, uh, what we do is we pay for our help is what happened, the drum groups, um, the money payout, which is a couple hundred, but it's all usually just to run, have the power around. So again, um, just being adaptable and, um, you know, always staying positive is just mainly the, the biggest trick to get, because in the end, it, all work, it, it will all work out. So that's what we mostly focus on. Um, this, it's a little tough for me because this is a KU sponsored event and our main <laughs> opponent is KU. They are, the administration is the main people that the, you know, the union is fighting in our own way. Um, so, uh, there are so many things that we don't win and I, but I mean, there, we do have victories and we try to focus on those. So maybe that's, I don't want to get too in the weeds because we've been in the middle of negotiating a new contract for almost two years. So like, I've got a lot of very specific things I could talk about. I mean, <laughs> we deserve a living wage. I'd love one of those, but um, we don't always get what we want. And so we try to, f I think focusing on the positive, like you were saying, and like really, not even just like internally recognizing you're like, hey, but remember we got, we accomplished this last year. Like, you know, GTAC was part of the push for get making sure um, people had options to teach online or in person last fall. So there are things we win, but um, I think when it comes to especially raises, <laughs> we're, I think we're headed towards at least a small victory, but um, yeah, focusing on the positives and publicizing wins, not even just saying like, oh yeah, we won this, like keeping internal encouragement. You have to like brag. You have to tell people like, no, we did this. We won something. Act activism, speaking up can pay off. You just have to be loud forever. So, um, <clears throat> before I speak about search, I want to say, can we get a round of applause for the underdog and being able that I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking about, as a social work um, graduate student, I think about all these numbers and I see it and only second person of color, to me that's, it's 2022. It's like we should be further than that. But um, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does, was there times in the past like when your organization um, struggled to achieve any goals that you had and then like how did you grow and learn from like, having to kind of struggle with stuff? Okay, so surge right now is actually the biggest struggle that we have is trying to get more students involved. Um, the pandemic definitely has hurt organizations a lot. It is really hard to do virtual tabling and trying to get that information out there. And Surge is actually a really good organization. Like we're really trying to get reproductive justice for everyone and gender equality. Sex education is such an important thing. And we have seen multiple times in history how not having the right education has led us to well, we could say disasters. Um, and right now, one of the biggest things that we're fighting and working towards is fighting this anti-abortion amendment that Kansas is trying to pass. Unfortunately, other states have passed it, recently Oklahoma. Um, and I'm hoping, hoping that search, you know, we can make a difference. And that's where the activism part is, is that we just wanna make people aware how important it is to be able to have these reproductive needs for everyone. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, so LFK Eats was started by like teenagers. Uh, Jimena and Cyan were, I think both 19 when it started. So um, it, it, it was hard to get off the ground. Um, and so far we've had like really strong success. We have a lot of uh, involvement, like tons of volunteers um, and we rely, I mean, since our goals are to make sure that people get fed, um, that means that we have to constantly be buying food 
um, which means that we are relying on a constant flow of donations. Uh, and sometimes that's hard to maintain. Um, it was hard to get off the ground with that. And then we got a flow going. We figured out how to use social media to our advantage. Um, and we, we kind of like figured out the game of like raising funds. Recently, though, it's gotten a lot harder. Um, a, there's like a pandemic happening still, uh, a slew of variables that make, uh, make it a lot harder for people to feel like they can contribute, like prices of everything are going up from food to gas, et cetera. So um, right now is, you know, we're still keeping the pantry stocked and everything. People are still being fed. Um, but, you know, we're having to like kind of go back to the table and and revisit our fundraising strategy because right now, you know, we're every time, every week when we are fundraising, we're losing a little bit of steam. Um, and that's partially a success and partially a failure because we've been able recently, because of how successful the organization has been, to expand beyond just providing food to also include uh, hygienic products um, and like giving uh, unemployed and underemployed people that don't have access to transportation, like rides to job interviews and taking their kids to daycare, things like that. Like even, um, when we're doing really well, we like help, uh, housing and secure people with rent. Um, and so it's a lot of the extraneous stuff. I say extraneous, even though it's like just as important as the rest of the stuff, but, um, the kind of later developments we've had to scale back a little bit and focus just on like stocking the pantry as, uh, funds decline. So this is like a new political moment, uh, given, you know, I mean, people are really falling on hard times right now. So we're having to navigate that along with everybody else that's navigating, you know, their own personal stuff. Uh, so it's tough. Um, yeah. And I would just say too, like, just obviously what the other panelists spoke to, um, again, yeah, obviously like still being in a pandemic is really difficult for everyone. Um, and I think too, like when you have, um, you know, identities or, um, like intersectionalities that pertain to you that already, like even before a pandemic, like weren't really getting serviced, like as they should be, it makes it like even more difficult. Um, you know, from like for you know the black student coalition like that's not currently active right now um just because of like covid and um you know even just new students coming in you know they're they're really just outreach and involvement as a whole i think for like students as a whole but also like new incoming students is um a lot lower than it usually is just because um you know, some of these, some of these like freshmen had to like grow up online for the last two years, you know? And so for them, it's like, um, you know, they're kind of relying on like the groups on campus to come like meet them where they are, which like we should be doing that anyway. But, um, but especially to like burnout is a very real thing. Like it affects you like mentally, physically, um, emotionally. And, um, you know, that can, that can be hard for just a student that's not involved in anything, but especially like when you're a student involved in a group or even just have like a substantial leadership role within a group, um, that can affect you a lot. And so that's something definitely like I have seen like among myself and like other like student leaders I've worked with both like in student senate and then like other organizations, um, and stuff like that, whether it's like on campus and even like off campus too. Um, but you know, it's, it's just a struggle that, you know, we gotta, it's just another challenge that we have to overcome. Um, you know, we continuously have to learn to be creative and, um, in our own ways, like overcome things. And, you know, um, ultimately like, you know, our communities and stuff like that have been doing that. Like it's in our blood, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, you know, it may be how that is now, but, um, just continuing to support each other, I think is ultimately what, um, keeps us going. So, yeah, you know, I'm glad y'all are still here though, <laughs> despite everything. Um, but yeah, uh, I really like this question. Um, so is there a specific activist organization or historical period that has inspired or influenced the way you engage with activism? And then I think we could do like, let the panelists go if they want. And then if there's anybody, um, like in the audience, like if y'all want to speak to this question too, I think it'd be really good to like hear, hear from y'all as well. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, um, well, recently to what just happened um, with the museum, the Spencer Museum of Art, um, I, and I don't know if this is the reason why I'm up here, but uh, 
I they, they have was it um the heap of birds um sign was uh destroyed or vandalized and then we um the fencer group we uh we had an awareness rally and I call it a rally because it's about bringing understanding you know that's what it's about we we prayed and we sang and we just wanted to let the the campus know that by not saying anything. Um, their silence spoke volumes to us that we we didn't matter. So we said, well, let's uh, let's go out there and you know maybe say some prayers. And I burnt some sage and um, you know just like again to bring awareness, and understanding that we're here and that we do matter. You know our voices need to be heard. Like uh, like um, I th I think Katie said, our voices need to be heard. And so that's what we did. And then two weeks later, um, uh, I got a sign got stolen. And so it 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 really upset me because as a, not just as a teacher's assistant that helps teach two classes for undergrads, and I could have been teaching one of them boys. Um, but it also as a, I was working at the art art um, store in Chalmers Hall, and I also just did the I was a narrator for the campus KU app with the common book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Klimmer. and I um so working not just three jobs here at KU it really it really bothered me that we just had this understanding of, um, you know, trying to be a, a good thing and it, it still came out a negative thing. So we, uh, in the rain, we went and I said, you know what, they, they want us mad. Well, okay, well, they're gonna, they're not just gonna get my my prayer songs. They're gonna get my war song. So I went out there and we sang and I, I, I told them that we're gonna let this rain wash our anger away. Cause it, it hurt so bad just being a student and being there just it made me so mad. And, I knew that's not how we had to handle things, but um, we I had to let them know how we felt. So we did it in the rain. We had to have an immediate reaction because we couldn't sit and wait till Monday for us to rally up again. We said, no, we're gonna do it. So I took the time off work from art. And I said, I gotta go, I gotta go. I gotta go pray, I gotta go sing right now. And so we went down there and then not too long, um, I got an email and um, and again, that was just raising you know awareness. And it was like, geez, I have to get mad to be heard. You know, that shouldn't be right. So. They had an understories at Spencer Museum. It was the backyard bash, and you know, I, and I was like, you know, I could, I could create a backdrop, you know, of me and of, of distorted images of my history because that's how our stories and our histories are perceived from non-indigenous people. They're distorted. They're not real. They're, they're vague, you know. So, I created that, and I, I, I on a, a six foot tall by twenty foot long backdrop, and I sang the story. I sang in the, the prayer, the songs, and the. The stories I told were the same ones I did at that rally and some of the ones at that protest. And so I did that to for um, indigenous representation, the indigenous art, and for to create these spaces here at KU now, because at the time it was like, wow, you know, so I went out there for about a week or two for two weeks and uh, was a live performance. And actually, um, I'll be doing another one at the Lawrence Art Free State Film Festival here tomorrow. So, and again, it's about creating these spaces, these um, um, not just for myself, but for non-Indigenous people, for understanding to uh, have these stories, our songs, and our prayers to live on, because that's what that's what it's about. You know, the artwork um, that it, it it's a representation just not of ourselves, but of our history and the history here. And uh, Lawrence, Kansas, has so much of that. This is where my parents met. This is where some of my uh, um, spiritual and religious beliefs come from. Um, the Native American church up in a Kickapoo reservation. So, and then the song that I'll be sharing at the end is actually a Kickapoo song. So I, I share these things and I get a lot of my history and my artwork and I, I call uh, artivism, you know, through my art is activism. And it's because it, it, it creates that bridge that we need sometimes in this community. And sometimes, even if it's just through art or me singing, or, you know, again, telling a story, it's. It's about, um, again, that understanding and creating and having that positivity of expressing ourselves and through our histories. And it just, it's really important. And I, I um, again, I, I'm so grateful for Spencer. And again, and, and I pray for those kids who did that because again, they lack that understanding, whether they're, they're ignorance or, you know, I mean, it was, it, it did make me bad, but I felt way better singing that song and praying for them because in the end, um, you know, I, again, I know that um, repercussions will be, will be made, but it's just, uh, I pray that they have the understanding of what they did. It was not just an act of vandalism, it was an act of uh, on uh, the history that has been told and repeated. And that's why it was so hurtful because it was like, wow, you know, I didn't know this was still to, alive today. And that's what, you know, we need to um, <clears throat> focus on is maybe, again, I was angry when I <laughs> when I sang those songs, but, Afterwards, I felt so good and I felt the love that I, that's what I wanted to feel is like, 
I wish they were there to feel not just the pain, but the love that I want them to feel from what they did. And that's what it was about, was uh, turning that um, negativity, that protest. Again, we were against it, but it was mainly for us because we had no choice. When sometimes you are not being heard the way you, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the, the oil, well, sometimes that squeaky wheel needs more oil than anybody else because we, need, we needed to be heard. And by that uh, act, it made us, uh, so I, um, again, with the representation on, on campus, that's what I'm here doing. Um, and we'll continue to do, and hopefully FENSA and the program and other indigenous students here will um, carry on, not just with their artwork, but with their professional, you know, like workshops, like um, GUI, like she said about some of the programs here, they um, got sidetracked. Well, that's why I had to step up because the undergrad um, didn't have the COVID kind of lacked in members. So I put the graduates indigenous um, group that I had created, which was called GUI, Graduates United by Indigeneity, on back burner because the graduate students need to come together for the undergrads. And again, that's what's about coming together and um, you know, creating these spaces. And that's what my art and, you know, again, being here is is creating these spaces for activism, for ourselves and for each other. So cool. Um, the question was sorry, it was about so just like a specific activist or Cool, okay. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research on queer activism, because that's my dissertation is kind of about that. So that's separate from my actual activism. I get, no, all my activism is queer activism. So um, it's, and I've been doing a lot of, uh, watching a lot of documentaries, because I'm a media person, um, and you know, fictional representations of the ACT UP movement, and the, you know, it's kind of a study for me also to apply in my life because um, the methods that they used were, I mean, it took a long time for them to be effective and there's lots of reasons for that, but there were a couple things that worked really well and it was shaming really specific people in the government um, and becoming so well educated on your issue that you can come up with the own, your own solutions and propose them and push them through. Um, so I basically have a second degree in Kansas labor law. Um, <laughs> I don't like knowing it. It's a bad state to work in. Sorry, everybody. Um, and so I, and also we're, we use the media a lot. GTAC attempts to use, uh, not use, that's utilize, utilize <laughs> work with, <laughs> communicate to, um, news media and try to get them to cover our stories because we know that embarrasses uh, KU admin um, to have their name in a, in a newspaper saying like, oh, they're not paying their graduate students. And they, that can spur them to action because ultimately, um, you know, I feel like we all kind of talked about this, retention and recruiting in college organizations is really hard, especially when you're a labor union who require people or, you know, to vote and stuff, you need to be a member, you need to pay dues. And then half of your membership graduates every year. It's not like a regular union shop where you have people in the same job for 20 years or whatever. Um, so it's that's a huge challenge for cap campus activism is every year you have to go find the people again who want to participate and bring them out of the woodwork and get them to tell their stories and share their voices. Um, so yeah, ACT UP has been really inspiring for me and I'm hoping to you know continue on there. I mean, obviously, I didn't leave it that, yeah. So um, I think I think what made made me like really start to really want to fight for reproductive justice and everything it was um, realizing that there's a lot of people who are in power that have no idea what people of color have to deal with when it comes to issues when it involves reproductive. Um, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to look back and say, I could have been a part of this movement. I could have made, I could have made a difference just by, even just by putting flyers or just getting one person, one person registered to vote. It like gets the little battles that count. And um, I didn't want to look back and say, I didn't do anything. So I, I want to do something and 
what makes me even more energized to fight is knowing that I have other people behind me who feel the same way as I do. And these abortion bans that are popping up around the country pushes me even more. And um, I just, I have sisters. I know that they have children, I don't, but I want other women, all genders to have just the right to make their own decisions when it comes to their bodily autonomy. And um, that's why I am involved in Surge. And um, any chance that I get, I always tell people about it and they always are very surprised. <laughs> um, definitely coming from a very conservative family where being Latina, we, we don't believe in abortion. And I stepped out of that. I got educated and I knew that it's not my place to tell somebody what to do with their body. That's their choice between their doctor and them. And so that's why I got involved and I started speaking out. And since I was little, I've been defending Latinos' rights. I've never stayed quiet just because somebody doesn't have speak the same language. And that's pretty much how I've always been. And I'm not going to stay silent, no matter how hard they try. Thank you. So we have um, a fairly eclectic uh, set of, of inspirations, I would say. Um, something that we'd like to say is that we stand on the shoulders of giants in, in what we're doing. And so I, I have a list of all of the different things that members of our organization say have inspired them and kind of the model of mutual aid. Uh, one is, the first one is like the long history of uh, Latine mutual aid societies um, started in this country around like the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, indigenous kinship systems that kind of see everyone as having uh, unique and important gifts and the importance of utilizing those gifts to help provide for others, especially those that um, are in need. Um, uh, another model was Asian immigrants creating mutual aid groups, uh, specifically around medicine sharing in the 19th century as there was uh, an immigration influx to the United States. Um, and then obviously there's, and this is a huge inspiration, is the entire history of um, black communal care ever since the, uh, you know, slavery reached this continent. Um, and so examples of that are like maroon communities of uh, escaped slaves, free black people pooling resources to buy land, provide for widows and children, um, and buy the freedom for people that, ha that were enslaved. Um, their more contemporary examples were, uh, and we take great inspiration from the Black Panther Party. Um, you know, obviously they, uh, one of their most successful programs was Breakfast for Kids, and they were feeding families and children, um, providing community defense, et cetera, political education for members of their communities as well. Um, and then this is less, explicitly about mutual aid, but something that um, we definitely look towards in terms of how they analyze the world and understand what creates the conditions for you know all of these systemic issues. And that's virtually all anti-colonial uh, and third world national liberation movements. Um, and the reason we find those so important is that they have, they recognized and identified capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy specifically uh, as systems which create the conditions that uh, result in all of these issues emerging, as well as demonstrating the necessity of resisting those systems directly rather than just treating the symptoms of them. Uh, and so that is how we approach all of those issues as well. And then the last thing I want to mention is uh, obviously just the current political moment. Um, it has become increasingly clear that our institutions are failing us. There are unprecedented crises happening in the world and in this country and more and more people are being left without any help from the institutions that ostensibly are supposed to be helping them in times of crisis, and they're not. And so um, what that means is that we have to directly organize the people in our communities to take care of each other because nobody else will.
Yeah, hard to follow after these amazing folks I'm here. Um, but yeah, I would just would say, um, and you know, I recently uh, was in DC and like for my job as student body president. Um, and, but one of the things, like the one thing that I knew like I was going to do when I was there, like no matter what, um, was go and see um, the, the Smithsonian Museum for um, African American um, like history, you know, in this country. And uh, it was very emotional. Sorry if I get emotional talking about it because it's emotional, but um, it was very emotional for me. Like I cried several times. Um, and, you know, one of the exhibits that they have in there um, that they're very like strict, like, you know, they only let a couple people in there. Like you can't take like any pictures or videos and stuff like that. Um, but they have like the original casket of Emmett Till um, in the museum. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, like Emmett Till, you know, was a child. Um, you know, he had uh, a rumor set against him and a group of white men um, lynched him. Um, beat him to until he was unrecognizable, wrapped him in barbed wire, and attempted to um, drown his body in, in a river. Um, you know, and one of the th one of the things you know that with that story th also that is like majorly talked about is like his mother's choice to um, show his body like in an open casket. Um, there were a lot, you know, we heard like in the museum from her, you know, there were people who told her that she shouldn't do that, like were urging her not to do that, um, you know, but she said it needed to happen because people needed to see like the realities that black people live through. Um, and especially during that time period, you know, this was, you know, 60s and 70s is kind of where we see like this major like black activism like in the United States. But um I think one of the things that we don't get taught often is just how rooted like activism and protesting and resistance is embedded like in black people in general. Um, you know, it's been here since before colonialism, you know, during and after. Um, one of the, one of the um, you know, black people um, have been protesting, you know, since like, the occupation, you know, of our homelands and, and stuff like that. And so, you know, there were slaves who were willingly, like willing to die, um, you know, drowned themselves, drowned their children and babies because they knew that, you know, they were never gonna see their land again. You know, they were never gonna see their home again. And, and instead of, you know, staying, you know, they willingly chose to protest by killing themselves. And one of the biggest like mass suicides in the United States in history was a collective of slaves, you know, who were about to be boarded, um, you know, like on the, or offloaded onto the East Coast to be sold, you know, as a group chose to collectively drown, um, you know, then enter, you know, into, you know, uh, enslavement. And so um, I would just say like, you know, there's many like activists and organizations and historical periods that, you know, I definitely um, could name regarding that. But I would just say, you know, I would just say like black people in general, like our people, like it's in our blood, you know, indigenous folks, like Latinx folks, like, you know, like a colonialism like tried to break us in every part, you know, of the world. And the fact that we're all sitting, the fact that we're sitting here just as individuals, but the fact that our communities are um, like still here, like still, you know, thriving, still getting education and getting in these leadership positions and fighting for policy change and fighting for laws. You know, we just had lynching become illegal in this country this year. It's 2022. Like, um, you know, in it, and so it's just, you know, yeah, I mean, our lines are just, our, us being here is activism and, and resistance in itself, um, because there have just been so many communities and, uh, or there's just, you know, been so, so much work to try to keep us from these spaces and, you know, try to kill our spirits and, um, you know, our, but our ancestors are always gonna be with us and that's what keeps us going. Um, and I think too, just like, again, you know, we we have a, a f almost, you know, basically a full table of women and fins up here. And I think that speaks a lot to how, um, you know, the February sisters, you know, made their mark, um, you know, on the campus and, and really kind of, 
um, set the stage for um, women equality and gender equality, you know, at KU, um, you know, and for women in FEMS, again, you know, um, I say women are the best, like, you know, women really do it all. And, and I think that these women from the February sisters really exemplify that because not only were they like students and, you know, working, but some of them were mothers and, or, and, you know, having to care for their families. And so, you know, they were the ultimate, you know, um, do all, and they still put it all on the line because they knew that standing up for women's rights, you know, whether it's, on this campus or in Kansas or just, you know, the entire country, you know, it mattered that much. And ultimately, you know, you, you have to be willing to sacrifice. You have to be willing to uncomfortable, um, you know, to fight for which to fight for what you need and to fight with for what's right, you know, when, when others aren't, um, you know, doing what they should be. So, yeah. Is there anybody who wants to, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Letha Johnson, and I'm the somewhat newish university archivist for KU. And I'm also one of the co-organizers for the KU Women of Color Support Network, as well as a member of the Black Faculty and Staff Council. And I have been involved um, in particularly um, Black faculty and staff since I got to KU in um, July of 20, actually 2008. Um, and I think the thing that keeps me going is, you know, these organizations, these campus groups, as, as well as the student groups, you know, do try to force the university to live up to its values and things and to actually make progress on um, these issues that, you know, we're all facing and, you know, basically telling them it's time to stop planning and start putting stuff into action. But um, I would say that when it comes to KU, what really does inspire me is actually 1970. Um, there were a lot of groups that came together on campus that um, worked together to help push each other's agenda because you had the anti-Vietnam um, War um, protesters, and then you had, you know, civil rights, um, gay rights, all of those groups kind of worked together and helped support and stuff, each other. But I would say in particular, the um, original Black Student Union <laughs> from that time. Um, it's, we refer to it um, just to help differentiate between that one and the one that was established later, later as the radical one. Um, they, like the February sisters, um, were successful in forcing the university to establish a black studies program. And before that was established, they were KU students, but they also worked with students at Lawrence High and they did different programs similar to, you know, distribution of food and um, actually culturally relevant food and did classes and stuff to help bring about um, education on the black culture. And during that time period, I think a lot of people don't really still know how bad it was in Lawrence and on campus and that Lawrence was put under a curfew. There was National Guard troops um, patrolling the streets and everything. But, you know, um, I think at that time there was progress made and it was slow progress, just like after um, the February sisters demand, they, demands they agreed to them, but it was, it took time for um, some of them to actually come to fruition and of course the pay things still going on, <laughs> nothing's changed. But and I think that's too also one of the points I'd like to make is that everything is cyclical. So we go through this again and again. And that's uh, one of the things like those groups that I'm in specifically involved in um, try to uh, move forward, things push things forward to actually make considerable um, progress. Um, on a side note, I, if you all have the time, I would love to meet with you briefly afterwards because as the university archivist, we are interested in 
collecting documentation about what you're doing because it is an important part of the university's history. And um, we're not concerned about if it's good for the university or not. It's still part of the university's history. And to get a um, complete history, you have to represent all sides. So, um, but that's uh, the 1970s and um, particularly that Black Student Union is really what inspires me to keep pushing for these things right now. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else want to share? Okay. Naya and Letha, I really appreciate what you said about February Sisters. I'm Kathy Rosemockery, sorry, left off my intro. Um, and I have a wonderful, inspiring February Sister sitting right behind me. And I would love for us to recognize her. Thank you. Christine Smith. Uh, I'm so glad that we're still working at this. <laughs> and it, it, in my lifetime, I've, I've had just enough successes to make it all worthwhile. When, when I saw the way the Democrats treated Fannie Lou Hamer, I would never have believed that I would see Obama in the presidency. Um, and yet, we're still not making any money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would also like to thank Christine. Um, I'm Megan Williams, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the assistant director of Emily Taylor Center. And um, like you said, Christine, this work is still going on today. You and I have partnered in the past um, when uh, the government was threatening sanctions against Iran just a couple years ago. Um, I, through the Answer Coalition, and you, through Lawrence uh, Coalition for Peace and Justice, worked together to, to protest that. Um, and so I'm grateful for you. Um, and in terms of historical movements, I'm also inspired a lot by the 60s and 70s, in particular movements that um, are expressions of socialist, feminist, anti-racist uh, politics, and especially those movements that are led by marginalized and oppressed people. So uh, the Black Panthers, especially the Black Panther women, are very inspirational to me, like Elaine Brown, who was the chairperson, um, uh, AIM, right, at the American Indian Movement, Leonard Pelletier, uh, and uh, for example, the Combahee River Collective, who were black socialist, lesbian, internationalist, feminist. Um, so yeah, they, they continue to inspire me today. My name's Terry Wilkie, and I'd like to ask everybody to vote no in August of 2022, when the, on the ballot will be a constitutional amendment that will ban abortion rights in Kansas. So it's very important, it's confusing, but vote no. Thank you. I second that. I'm uh, Catherine Emith Tuttle, and I was involved with the planning of this. And I just want to thank everybody, especially Christine. She inspires me every day. But I'm inspired by KU students. I wrote a chapter on the student senate leadership changes that happened starting in 1968. The first smart thing they did was they got control of the student fee, which is very unusual for most universities. And I know it, there's limitations and the apathy and all of that. But when you look at February Sisters pro, uh, demands, the um, child care center, that was funded through student fees. Uh, the demands related to health care, students led that. Uh, environmental issues, the Whomper was an original uh, um, can smasher that the students in it started. Disability rights, students had a huge role in that. I mean, when you look at this line of progress at the university, KU students were there at the forefront and still are. So it's so wonderful to hear you talk tonight because you really have made a difference in the university for decades and I'm, I'm glad to see you're gonna continue to do that. Anybody else? Yes. Um, 
I'll just add that um, because of the changeover in university archives, we're very late on this, but we are working on an online exhibit to honor the February sisters. Um, I just finished edits <laughs> this week for it. So um, that's still waiting to be done. So look for that on the Spencer Research Library website. <laughs> Yes, 1971, um, K, 1970, the year that Rock to KU is um, still up on online. Back to you all. Awesome. Um, so I think this is an important question. Um, and also just speaking to like your point of like bragging, like when you do get those, um, when you do get those wins, um, you know, because obviously like when you're doing activism work, like you said, you know, you're not always gonna get what you want and need, you know, maybe the first time around, even the second, even the third, maybe even the fourth, um, but keeping at it and like acknowledging like when you get those wins um, is I think uh, really important. So um, we can go down the line and then, yeah. And then I'll, or uh, let me start just so we can, all, <laughs> we can do it that way. But um, um, one of the things that, um, again, yeah, speaking to obviously like being a part of student Senate and being student body president, um, you know, again, like us, you know, we just passed the fee, um, last night actually. <laughs> um, and so that's going to be going up to KBOR, but as you know, this year, um, you know, really just speaking, you know, this year we really um, fought to get some um, initiatives in place on this fee. Um, one of the things that I'm extremely proud of, um, just because it's something that I've talked about with like the Haskell student body president, and it's something that, um, you know, Haskell students, um, you know, have really been needing, um, you know, in, in KU as well, um, especially for like our exchange program and stuff that we have here and that I participated in. But, um, Next year, uh, we have it to where there's going to be a stipulation with transportation where Haskell students can ride free. They no longer have to pay, um, you know, the 50 cent fee and uh, all that good stuff. And so that's something that we really, um, you know, fought for and, um, you know, had maintained for the fee this year. Um, one of the unique things about this position um, that I don't think everybody knows about is that there's actually like a student senate um endowment fund that the student body president gets to allocate every year towards initiatives and stuff like that um that they care about and so um still getting the thing solidified um but um there will be i'm working with the current bsu president um, and vice president and endowment and um, our vice provost of student affairs, Dr. Durham, um, to create the Black Student Union Endowment Fund at KU. So this will be the first like direct fund that can directly go towards um, the Black Student Union um, programming for Black students and then possibly um, even like grants and scholarships for Black students specifically, um, which I think is a great win because obviously it's something that we definitely need on campus. Um, and I'm actually really excited that you spoke up. Um, because uh, I was talking with like the current um, uh, BSU um, like outgoing and incoming, um, but we want to name the fund after, um, you know, a like legacy or like alumni person like from um, the original like BSU. So we'll definitely have to talk, but that's just uh, some of the things that like I'm really like proud that we're able to do this year um, and that I'm excited that I get to be a part of and kind of just leave as my own little legacy at KU before I move on, so. Oh, Six, successes. Um, well, as an indigenous woman, it's hard to say, you know, because we, one of the main things is we like, we stay humble, you know, so it's and being modest and it's kind of hard to be like, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> you know, so it's, for me, it, it gets embarrassing because it's like, I, I feel wrong for doing that. It, it's not something that we should do as leaders or Indian people is brag, you know, but, um, but when we do, it's usually about our communities and our workers, because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people before me or these people next to me, because I couldn't, you know, do what I could by myself. I couldn't express who I am if it wasn't for my family and their rights that they fought for. Um, one thing my dad would always say is, uh, we're always going to fight for the right to be Indian. Even my children, when I have some, <laughs> they'll, they'll fight for the right to be Indian, because that's one thing that we're gonna be continuously doing is fighting for the, the right to be who we are 
to live the way we want to live. And that's, you know, our rights as Indians is to live off the land, even though we gave it, gave up our, our land, we never gave up our rights to be who we were and that's, or who we are. And that's the most important thing is our sovereignty and our culture and we're all different. There's over 574 tribal nations in this country alone. That's not including the ones outside of these borders of North America. And I include those indigenous people because there were no borders and, so a lot of so again like uh, I'm I'm just happy to be here and I'm happy to exp you know it took me a long time to talk I still get a little emotional because it's again it's a I'm, I'm I i do not like to get up and talk in front of people but when I'm telling stories or singing and it don't feel that way I feel as like a, a community and like I'm praying we're, we're in a circle together so I try try to think of it that way and um so again um again I I I'm just proud to be here uh, my my family and um, being raised the right um, the way I was um. I was a little kid just playing tag and and through these rallies I remember 1992 we was at the we were protesting Columbus Day the they were reenacting um reenacting the arrival of Columbus in San Francisco I was like 10 and I got to I got out of school and everything it was the only time I got to get out of school was for protests and rallies and so we got there and uh we we were rollerblading rollerblades just came out and, <laughs> and so I just remember there was just thousands of Indians but to me it was just something normal and something and you know and so I'm grateful for being raised in those things and hearing the word sovereignty I didn't I heard that all the time and I was like oh, dad's up there talking you know <laughs> you're it you know we would, but it was just more of it was fun and I, I I'm just so grateful to grow up that way because I wouldn't be here standing up and here saying the same things that they did and, and you know one thing it's like you always speak from your heart because you can't go wrong there you know and so i try to do that everything i do i try to what would my dad say or what would he do to try to to, to bring people to understanding who we are you know because that's what it's about is uh, understanding and you know we're all different but we all have our own story and again it's coming together and um for the better of everybody for the better of not just you know, black, white, or Indian, red, you know, it's about everybody because we're all here together and that's what it's about. And again, I just want to say thank you to the the lovely sister back there in the back. You know, again, if it wasn't for you, we would not be sitting here talking about this <laughs> stuff. And again, I'm just grateful for everyone um, coming here and taking their time because again, that's what it is, taking the time to understand and listen because, you know, we are so quick to respond and not listening to understand. And that's what I think we need to do as not just activists, activists, but as um, people who are part of a community, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think I was having a hard time choosing, but I think the victory that I'd like to speak a little bit, get in a little bit of the weeds of Can Kansas labor law, just a tiny bit, um, there was a, KU and GTAC are at an impasse with our contract negotiations, which means we went to like another step. So we had a fact finder that we both had to pay for. Well, I don't know what that's about. Um, come in and like adjudicate a, um, what's the, I don't remember what the product was called. Oh, it was like a, a statement of fact. So he had a recommend, he came up with a recommendation for what KU should do, what our contract should look like, because we went to impasse on. You guessed it, wages. Um, so we, you know, it was a really long, very official and formal and TBH stodgy process. Um, but, you know, KU has hired a union busting lawyer to present their case and their the CFO showed up and, you know, rattled on about numbers for half an hour. And we had people come and, you know, give their stories about, you know, the housing that we're able to afford on our stipend. And just, you know, our political chair had a really great presentation of all the reasons that we should get paid more money. Um, and we, it wasn't, the fact finder didn't agree 100% with us, but you can go read the statement, it's public now. Um, he said that we should get raises and that it's uh, unfair for KU to assume that we would accept no raises in a contract. So um, that was that was this month. Yes, um, or last month, I guess. But yeah, so it was really cool, and it was great. To, yeah, I mean, um, but unfortunately, it is not binding because um, KU again is a super fun state to work in. Uh, so we get to now continue to negotiate with KU about what happens next. So still on the team, still working, but it was a victory, and it was really cool because we just, I mean the. The demographic of the lawyer made us think maybe we didn't have a great chance. So we were very excited when things kind of went in our, way, our favor. So that was really cool. Um, so you guys' victory sounds so much better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. 
Um, mine's just a little victory, just like being able to provide education and um, providing the students with um, safer sex kits and also making people aware of what our health clinic here at KU offers because not everybody is aware that you can get STD test for free, pap test, birth control, and um, just bringing awareness to all that. Um, but I count that as a big success in my book because not everyone is educated in sex. <laughs> But yeah, you all said it best when it came to. So I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we kind of have the same metric of success, and that's um, that every time we have to restock the pantry, that's a big win because it means that people have been eating our food that we've been putting there, uh, and we restock it usually at least twice a week. So that's a lot of people getting fed. Um, we have raised money to prevent several evictions in the past year that we've been active. Uh, which is a big deal by itself, but a really big deal in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so those are obviously, I think, our two biggest ones. Um, but we also think that uh, we've been getting phones out uh, and, and funding phone plans for houseless people to make sure, especially like this winter was really bad. Uh, and so anytime there was like a really bad winter storm, they had access to us. Um, and the Lawrence Mutual Aid Network, that, who we collaborated with to make sure that they had what they needed. They had like tarps for precipitation. Um, they had propane uh, for heat and you know, whatever they needed for fires, et cetera. Um, so it's like, it's a lot of little things. Um, and you know, a lot of times when we're like, oh man, we gotta, we gotta restock the pantry, uh, you know. Um, it, it's easy to get caught up in the minutia. It's like, that means there's work to do, but uh, it means that people aren't going hungry. So uh, I think that's just like everyday successes like that and they really add up and it means a lot to us. Uh, oh, and before I pass it on, I also wanna say, Christine, uh, it is an honor to be here celebrating you and hopefully doing justice to your legacy. So thank you so much. Um, oh, I was just gonna say, I think we have about time for one more question and then we can open it up and then we'll be at about time. I could, I could be here all night, but. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, and again, Christine, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a privilege to obviously like get to meet you. Hopefully we'll get to talk after this, but, um, and yeah, just like celebrating you and like these women that you worked with and you know, the legacy you're leaving. So um, yeah, I'm just grateful to be in this space with all y'all tonight. So um, yeah, let me, Okay, I think this is a good one to leave with. Um, what advice do you have for students who are interested in getting involved with your organization and your activism in general? Well, I would say find out what they like to do. Find out who they are and what interests them because if you're doing something for someone else or something else, then you're not gonna have that passion for it. Um, Fortunately, I, uh, I have passion for indigenous causes. And, and, and again, it's not, a, they're not just about indigenous people, but non-indigenous people. My dad wasn't enrolled until right before he died in 50, when he was 52. So uh, he was a non-Indian for a long time, fighting for Indian rights. And because we don't need a piece of paper saying who we are. So, um, but no, I, I, I would encourage students to test it out. I'm, I just came from a screenwriter. I'm a vice president of the Screenwriters Club here. And uh, so I just came from that meeting and I had to go change. and. I figured, well, hey, what should I wear? So I decided to wear the sweatshirt to, you know, because it says, you know, I'm here, and I, I, I just love this sweatshirt. My friend made it, and but I, I would really like uh, students to find out their passions and stick with that, because once you do, you'll find people who are exactly think the way you do and who are passionate about the things you are, and it will grow from there. And then from there, you'll networking, and then you'll find other people who have similar, you know, causes and similar, you know things you like and that's what it's about is opening up your circle and you know broadening it and I think networking by doing different things even things you don't like um, just go there just to see what it's about I, I would just go for the free food to be honest because <laughs> you know as a graduate student you know you want more pay we you know it's uh, food was, was great because it was a great way to meet people and you know again get, the, get a bunch of testers so um, I would say just go out there and just step, take a step and go from there. You know, your feet will lead you the right way, whether, wherever that's at. And, you know, there's no wrong, there's no wrong journey. So 
That's, that's good advice. Um, I think two pieces of advice. Um, I think, I mean, this would probably go for activism in general. Uh, getting too far into idealism can lead you to just getting in theoretical arguments and then you don't get anything done. But that's pretty basic. Um, <laughs> but then the other one is, um, I think a piece of advice that I would give, and not even just for activism, is try and find, like explore your path, like, you know, go to lots of meetings. But um, a big problem I have faced in my life is, uh, it seems like the world is burning everywhere you look. Um, so it's hard to pick a thing to commit your time towards. Um, so I, I think if you, can, if you find that you have, a, um, your talents are suited towards one organization or a certain kind of role, find a way to apply that and just kind of drill down on one thing. Um, Cause I've had to like quit other organizations because I'm not because I'm spending too much time in the union, but because that's where I have I feel like I'm doing the most benefit. And me trying to spread my talents over ten organizations does nobody any benefit. Um, so, I mean, being members of stuff is cool. You should join your union. But um, <laughs> if you're doing if you're on like five different leadership teams, you're actually not a good leader anymore. Unfortunately, it's not. It's just a case of if you have all the time in the world, that's cool. Um, so that's. Yeah, um, pick, pick a, explore, but then pick a thing. I, I think I agree with both of you. It's just finding your passion, um, what you're also good at, and then just explore it, and then go for it. Yeah, but definitely the passion, I think, is the, whole, the main one, because if you don't have passion for something, you're not going to want to do it, and you're not going to want to go to these meetings and you're, it's not going to be productive for anyone. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, definitely agree with everything that's been said so far. This felt like the most important question to me for anyone listening that wants to like start organizing or, or be involved in campus activism or what have you. So I wrote down several things, but I'll, I promise I'll keep it short. The first thing is that the most important thing is to just get out there and try and know that you will fail inevitably at some point. There will be failures and that is a good thing because it means you learn from it uh, and you know what not to do the next time. You take note of that, uh, you reflect and self-criticize and then you know how to proceed, what to change. And every time there's a failure, that's something to learn from and that's something to improve your tactics. Uh, the second thing is directly engage the communities that are affected by whatever issue you've chosen to make your thing. Um, Organizing means constantly struggling and you have to be struggling with those communities. The only way to know their needs and whether you're meeting them is struggling with them and engaging them directly. Um, the third thing is to know what you're up against. This is, in my opinion, maybe the most important thing. Um, and I mentioned them before, you're up against, if you're doing the right work, you're up against capitalism, you're up against imperialism and colonialism, and you are up against white supremacy. Uh, and that makes the task seem kind of enormous. Um, but you need to recognize that those systems will throw their full weight against you because their, your success weakens their grasp on power. Uh, so don't let that discourage you even though it you know, really makes the task seem enormous, but you should let it motivate you to get really serious about whatever it is you're tackling. Um, the fourth thing is never trust police. Um, minimize engagement with them. Never deal with them if you don't have to. Never trust them. They're never on your side if you're doing the right work. Um, because they represent, thank you. They represent the interests of those systems discussed before, and so they're always gonna be against you if you're doing the right work. Uh, this extends to landlords, this extends to CPS uh, and DCF, uh, and this includes ICE as well. Um, none of those organizations, none of those institutions are going to help you. They're always against you. Never engage with them. Never help them. Anything like that. Never trust them. Uh, and the last thing is never stop reading. Um, you have to understand the systems that we talked about if you want to successfully organize within them and against them. Um, and like I said before, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There are, we have centuries of inspiration to draw from. So you never will feel like you're doing this on your own if you keep reading and learning from past historical examples of people that have done this stuff before. Um, that's why we're here uh, celebrating Christine is because Christine is one of those giants on whose shoulders we stand and we have learned from her 
uh, and all of her sisters. And just like we've learned from the other past centuries of, of organizers and people that have resisted all the things I mentioned before. So never stop reading, never stop learning. Uh, and that's what I have to say. And then, yeah, y'all, I mean, I can just add a couple of things to that because I feel like that was, yeah, I mean, pretty much the breakdown. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, just kind of like leading off of what Jim said, like, you know, with, you know, reading, um, especially like in this country, like the reason why, you know, black people fought so hard in this country to obtain education, to obtain the rights to read and write, to obtain, um, you know, establishing institutions that are not, you know, labor heavy and actually focus on, um, you know, like humanities and liberal arts and things like that is because black people have always known like the power of education in our communities. And like when it is in our hands, um, you know, we can't be stopped. And, you know, that's something that, you know, slavery, colonialism understood, you know, because they're goal was to, you know, weaken the mind, but strengthen the body. Um, and so I would just say, yeah, ultimately, like education is one of the biggest um, powers you can hold. And, you know, that doesn't just mean like traditional classroom education that can just that can be any type of education, whether it's, you know, education about activism or certain leaders that, you know, you're passionate about or a certain subject or, you um, you know, even just like um, traditional, like indigenous education and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's important, like, you know, at every level, um, you can utilize it in many different ways to not only like help yourself in liberation, but also help different communities that you care about in liberation as well. Um, and so, and then I would just say too, like taking the time to care for yourself, um, establishing a really good like support system, both like within, um, you know, like the organization that you're a part of, but also a good um, support system outside of the organization as well. Because I think that sometimes, especially like when you do activism work, especially that involves like the identities that you hold, um, it can be very hard to have that separation of like your activism work and then taking it home with you and, and, and stuff like that. And so there's going to be times like when that's going to happen and when that's going to be like very needed, but there's also going to be times when, um, you know, you need to kind of disconnect and take a break. And so, um, for me personally, like my support system is my mother, like my mother's a white woman. She's never going to understand, um, like that, the, you know, black woman that I am all the time. She's never going to stand in that side of my identity fully. Um, but she loves me and she supports me and she does, whatever she can um, to support me in the work that I do for black women and being a black um, queer woman. And so even if that's like taking a call for me at 2 a.m. and or texting me she loves me or like a funny, you know, gif or whatever it's called or, you know, just, you know, surprising me like one day to like get coffee or something or, um, you know, small things like that are like really what matters to me and really kind of what get me through like just my day and like being a student and being like an activist and taking on the heavy work, um, you know, that I do in the various spaces that I'm in. And so that can, and I would say too, like for students and, you know, obviously like we got some of our elders up in here, um, but with y'all as well. And I would just say the last point is listening to your elders is, is the biggest thing because because ultimately like they have lived through it like they've done they've done the work before you like they like getting um obviously being respectful about it but like sitting and listening to them and getting that knowledge and respecting them and and you know kind of giving them their flowers and understanding that like they've struggled before you so valuing that advice valuing that previous knowledge and you know asking them like hey you know is this the like do you think this is a good way to go about this or you know what are some things that you might have ran into when you attempted to do this work and um, always just honoring like the elders in your community um, whether it's like familial or not um, or like culturally or not, you know, at the end of the day, like um, elders are just so important. And, you know, at the end of the day, like if it weren't for our elders, you know, we wouldn't in their work and accomplishment and like putting the blood, sweat and tears like into that work, you know, long ago um, and even not so long ago, like we wouldn't be here um, today getting the opportunity to do the work ourselves to continue that legacy. So, yeah. Yeah, but I think we're good for a Q&A now. <laughs> or... We're actually pretty much at time. Um, okay. And so I want to keep us, you know, uh, honest here about the, the time. Um, mm -hmm. A kind of 
open question that I think I'd like to end with after thanking you all so much for participating in this um, discussion is, you know, what does solidarity look like to you? How can we support you? And I think those are questions that um, we can continue having conversations about. Um, and so I know I would love to continue to have those conversations with you. I'd like to have the right to ask the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm an old head. Um, my uncle went to Haskell. Uh, my, both my parents went to KU. I'm a Lawrence community member. I'm also hard of hearing. And what I'd like is to have the panel, uh, I put my name and email address, you put your name and email address. And I'd also like to task uh, Megan, your group, to create like a February sisters, post February sisters or February's, whatever you want to call it, email, central email thing so we can start sharing things together. I, I have a friend in Philadelphia who's a back Black Panther. Uh, he was beat up all the time, giving Black Panther news, newsletters, selling them on the street corner. And what he's doing now is he's going in the community door to door to take guns away from families, get, surrendering their guns so their children don't kill other people. And he's just totally disheartened with what he's doing. But to be able to get him on Facebook, I want to get you connected. That'd I want you to get you connected to a woman who I still know, still friends with, actually, the wife of the Black Panther, who was the founder of NARAL, National Association of Rights, or whatever, National Abortion Rights Action League. Anyway, I'd like you to do that. Like yeah. yeah. And then um, I know Megan, <laughs> we're at the time, but um, we will do this. And then um, I really want to um, have us close out with um, Tisa doing her tobacco song if she was comfortable doing it. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'll sign your thing too. Uh, I mean, no, uh, the being here just being an honor. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, the re again, taking the time for yourself and but uh, sometimes you step in these positions, we don't have time. And again, I, I just appreciate being, having the words to talk to you and sharing this song. It's a, a Kickapoo song. Um, it comes, uh, my family was came back in the 70s during, you know, again, protesting for sovereignty rights and Indian rights. And along the way, they uh, were urban Indians. So um, a lot of the times we don't have a way. So pan-Indianism with sweat lodges and stuff. Uh, Native American Church came, and so 1978, we had the right to pray. And uh, so uh, Native American Church is a peyote, peyote meetings. Um, we use peyote, and we sit down all night, and when the sun goes down, we go in a teepee, and when the sun comes up, we come out, and we just sit there and pray together, and we sing. And one of these songs derived from it, and it's a tobacco song from the Kickapoo Nation, and um, we took our ways, and we took it back up there to Washington State for the Indian people to have a way to pray. And we didn't, and I'm, gonna sh I'm sharing this with you because... Uh, it was a man's song and women don't sing and we don't sing with the drum, we don't use the instruments, we just back up our men because we, we're already close to God, we give life. But um, we didn't have a sweat lodge um, song, a woman's sweat lodge song. So my aunt took this tobacco song and she took the drum out and she slowed it down and um, she ma made it into a, the sweat song that we have today for our woman's sweat lodge. And I like to share it because not just from the Kickapoo people here, but because it shows the adaptability and the perseverance and the change that we need as Indian people to continue to survive and to grow. So I wanna share this song in honor of the, the Kickapoo Nation and my, my ancestors, my Utwais, my pastways. And um, it, what I'm saying is uh, they, uh, spirit tobacco, uh, show me the way, hear my prayer, is what I'm saying. <laughs>
samawi wa nahiyana ya wino samawi wa nahiyana heyona heleyo we apara thank you Thank you again, and I just want to say I raise my hands to each and every one of you for being here, and especially to Christine for allowing us to be here and represent you in a good way. <laughs> well, yeah, I think with that, um, if no one else has anything, I think we are leaving it off good, and uh, I think we can break now. So, again, just Happy to be here with you all. Happy to be here celebrating Christine's legacy and, um, you know, the February sisters' legacy. Um, you know, they kind of started, you know, this movement of like uh, women and femme activism um, and kind of setting the stage and that path for, you know, women and femmes uh, on campus today to continue doing that work and fighting for uh, women and gender, women and gender equality um, and rights at KU and. You know, one of the questions I have in my closing is, you know, did the February sisters know, you know, that their would their actions uh, be documented in history, you know, or their form of protesting um, be seen as an act of resistance for the greater good of like women's rights? And, you know, ultimately, whether that was planned or not, or the, the answer to that is yes or no. Um, you know, we get to celebrate them. Uh, we get to celebrate Christine tonight and the, adv the advocacy that they did accomplish, um, you know, for the greater good of women and fem. So thank you. Thank you.